take responsibility for the mind and, and for all perceptions. And so, the first thing is just to, to just admit that the pain is a perception. It's a misperception, actually, we could say. It's, a, it's always a misperception. And then, um, what you were talking about in your group, it sounds like that was right on the right track in the sense of letting yourself really, really face what you're feeling. I mean, there's so many ways, it seems, in this world to kind of disguise, distract away, um, to try to dissipate, deny, repress, whatever. There's a lot of tricks, but in, as opposed to just facing it, you know. And some teachers have called it, you know, like going into the pain. I would say more is like you're going into your mind. This whole world and this whole cosmos was made to, to keep you mindless. You know, it's like a, a big trick to forget the mind entirely. And the trick, you, you might say, it seemed to be successful even when, when there's all this talk about the brain. You know, the brain is just an, another aspect of the, the dream world. But to talk about the brain and neurotransmitters and hypothalamus and break it apart and diagnose it and say what parts, you know, control what parts and what parts when you touch an electrode to what parts, what happens in the body, and this and that. It's part of a whole system that's really designed to keep you mindless, to keep you unaware of the mind, to kind of keep you feeling like you're out of your mind, <laughs> like you've lost your mind, and, and, uh, and make it be normal to have lost your mind. I'm out of my mind. Where did it go? I don't even know. <laughs> well, what's going on now? Well, I've got a brain. Oh, a brain, okay. I've got a brain. i got a brain and i got a body. i got a world. You know, the, the amnesia is so complete. The mind, the divine mind has been so pushed out of awareness now that it's not even a topic of conversation. You know, how many people do you see, you know, go out and you know, just have chit-chat about the divine mind? <laughs> What do you think about the divine mind? Oh, you know, it's just not even in the public dialogue anymore. It's, it's amnesia, it's gone, it's pushed out of awareness. In fact, David, if you talk about that, they lock you up in mental mm. institutions. <laughs> <laughs> right. You're crazy if you just talk about that, yeah. <laughs> and they treat your brain. <laughs> they lock you up, give you drugs, and treat your brain. Uh, so it's, it's a pretty tight kind of illusion, like a closed system. To be mindless, you know, and uh, and it's all just terminology. But as I remember when I was in Sweden, uh, I was on the, the west coast of Sweden, and they said you should come here, David. They they have a festival. It's a non-duality festival that they have, and people come from all over the world. Byron Katie, and they get uh, Eckert, and all these different people, and they have it on, on this like east coast of Sweden. I said, well, what's the name of the conference? And they said, No Mind. <laughs> that was the name of the conference. I said, wow, the No Mind Conference. <laughs> it's kind of funny, coming, my spiritual journey was through the Course, where Jesus kind of flips it around and, and He says, You are mind, holy mind, and purely mind. You know? And he basically says, you know, it's kind of a choice. You can either accept that you're all mind, or you can make up a concept. Uh, and that concept can involve a body, and a world, and time and space, and everything else. But he was just speaking of the divine mind. In fact, he does say in the Course that the, the mind is the activating agent of spirit. An interesting phrase from Jesus activating agent of spirit. In other words, if spirit is just what reality is, you reach it through your mind, the way that he's talking about mind. But his, his mind is, is, is coming into abstract mind, not mind in a sense of private mind. Even his metaphor of right mind, wrong mind, people say, that is extremely dualistic. I'm, not, I'm a non-dualist, and, and Jesus has got all this right mind, wrong mind stuff. And Jesus is basically saying, no, you believe in two, and then you project a world out, and you see the two out in the world to convince yourself 
that you don't believe in too. <laughs> you think that you're a whole person. Nonsense. There's no such thing as a whole person. Uh, you, you think that you have a mind of your own, but you don't. He's saying, you, your mind, you live in the mind of God. And there's only one mind, you, you know, that's the mind, the divine mind. You can't, you don't have like a partition of that mind, like God's got this big divine mind and then you've got a corner of it, a mini divine mind. You don't have a mini divine mind, there are no minis, there's no mini me's. <laughs> it's just, there's just the capital M me, the Christ, the, the Son of God, the divine. So, so we're coming from a place now where we've bought into this trick to become mindless and now we're trying to be mindful. That's like a Zen word. Mindfulness is a Zen practice. We're learning to pay attention to the mind. And in order to do that, you do have to face whatever thoughts come up in the mind. And that's where the, the pain seems to come in. It doesn't so much matter whether it seems to be experienced in a body, or in a body that you call your own, or in another body. It's just the very perception of it is a misperception. I think one of the most helpful uh, parts of the course that helped me was when I was going through the workbook, and Jesus said, if God is real, there is no pain. And if pain is real, there is no God. I thought, wow, that is really, let's talk about hitting it straight on, hitting the nail on the head. It wasn't going to try to do a, some kind of evasive maneuver. If God is real, there is no pain. If pain is real, there is no God. And then, if you seem to be perceiving pain, you've got to take the perception up, lift that perception up towards that, that state of mind. He's talking divine metaphysics there. If, if God is all in all, God is all knowing and all loving and all powerful, where does that really leave room for pain? Where does where is there room for pain in all loving, all knowing and all powerful? There just isn't there isn't room for it. The old thing, there is no spot where God is not. You know, that God is is omnipotent, God is omniscient, God is everywhere, everything then then the real question is when you're perceiving pain is you have to start to take it inside and, and go, hmm, maybe I need to get in touch with the ridiculous belief in pain. Instead of just accepting it as a reality and, and asking the question, how do I deal with it, is maybe I should, should get at the underpinnings of it. Maybe, and it's quite a common experience, like you're saying, to, when there's a perception of it, to say, just, just let it stop. Let it stop. Even people in this world that seem to go through, you know, what would be called a debilitating illness, and then they seem to go, grow weaker and weaker, and seem to suffer and suffer and suffer, and then die, you will hear people say, well, at least now they're at peace. Uh, you know, it's a quite a common thing, like, it's like they go through this long, grueling, painful experience and then they die. And then they, it's the R.I.P., rest in peace. Like, for, thank God they at least died. Put them out of their misery. It's an interesting belief that death would put you out of misery. You know, if that was actually the case, then wouldn't it be a goal for everybody to be dead? <laughs> I mean, if really, if peace, of, if peace is the goal, and you can rest in peace by dying, it would be like, that would be the biggest business on earth. You, know, you could get out of being peace an attorney right. and just there wouldn't be anybody become left. Dr. Death. <laughs> Rack it up. Just charge high fees. You can rest in peace, but it's going to cost you a million dollars. You know, I'll kill you, put you out of your misery. It's just bizarre. And then Jesus comes along and, and he says, no, this, this kind of thing that's more like an epitaph, rest in peace that they put on, on tombstones and you see it at Halloween's rip. No, it, that's for the living. That was meant for the living, not for the dying. That's for the living, rest in peace. And how do you live eternally except through forgiving illusions? 
if the illusions had blocked eternity from your awareness, and they're blocking you from knowing your eternal reality, then of course you'd have to forgive or release the illusions to live. You know, when Jesus said 2,000 years ago, you know, you know, that you must become born again, he wasn't talking about converting to Christianity, you know, from Islam or something. Uh, it was, he was talking about he was talking about a resurrection of the mind, the mind recognizing the divine self that it is, the oneness that it is. So, uh, you know, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven until you are born again. He was talking about a rebirth, a, a re-experience of that spirit, which, which is forever our true nature. That's all it was. But it didn't really have anything to do with, um, with reincarnation or, you know, entering a body once or many times. It was just simply of turning the mind right side up and recognizing that. So, I think Debbie, the best thing to do is, is to say, okay, what I'm perceiving with my partner and what I'm feeling is my opportunity for, for healing. It's my opportunity to, to begin to question the belief